All right. First chap, second chapter of First Peter, talking about suffering. Verse 21 says, But even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. What does that first part of that verse say? Mm-hmm. What did it say? I just read it. We were called to suffer. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. You know, guile means it's something that shouldn't be, it's like a bitterness, something that makes you, it's a, like a bitter taste in something that makes you throw up. And it's like a, in other words, what that's talking about is it wasn't any. He he never said anything bitter towards anybody. It was all truth. It wasn't out of malice. Whatever he spoke, even though he said, "You Pharisees, hypocrite," that was the truth. He wasn't speaking it because he didn't like them. He was speaking it, or ha- that he actually didn't that he had anything against them. He was speaking it because it was truth. So why does this? Why does Peter tell us? Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. Why? Why? How does that relate to suffering? Well, it relates because that's the way mankind thinks that, oh, if you're good, then only good will happen to you. That's, that's how mankind tends to relate um, things. And if you're a bad person, then you can expect, expect bad things to happen. Um. Mm. All right. So verse 23, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, now, let's think about that. Here's Jesus Christ, God, in the flesh. Yeah, and he made it. No, 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 no. You're right in what you're saying. We're going to get to that in a second. That's in another chapter. You're exactly right in what you're saying. We're going to get to that. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. Now, he made it plain. When the, when they came and laid hands on him to take him, Peter withdrew his sword and cut the cut. The high priest servant's ear off, and Jesus healed the man, put the ear back on. And he looked at Peter and said, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. He said, don't you think that if I don't want to go through this, I can call and the Lord and God will send 12 legions of angels on my behalf? When he suffered, he threatened. Now, he didn't tell him, look, I'm going to let y'all go ahead and crucify me. But you best know who you're dealing with. Now, I'm going to tell you what is at the heart of the anti-suffering campaign, and that is pride. Pride says, I I should not be mistreated. I should not. I deserve better. And really what you're saying is, you're better than Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what you're saying. Even when you get offended, you're saying, I'm better than the Lord. The Lord didn't get offended. If he had got offended, he would have reviled. You see? So when when folks walk around thinking they're not supposed to go through anything, thinking that everybody's supposed to just, you know, treat them right and everything's supposed to be lovely, peaches and cream, even in marriage, God didn't design for two people to come together so that they can get along the whole time they're together. You learn more about yourself in marriage than you do in any other relationship because that's the person that you're with on a daily basis. They're going to get on your nerves sometimes. Sometimes things aren't going to go right. And it is God the whole time trying to teach lessons. What lessons? 
And uh, that's what I posted yesterday on my, that's what I tweeted yesterday on my Twitter account. That don't pray and ask God to change your spouse. Because he's not going to do it until he first changes how you react to your spouse. That's the way it's designed to be. So we can cry, we can complain, Lord, it was just, everything would just be all right if my spouse did this, if they acted that way, or if they just, you know what God is saying? No, everything would be all right if you learn to deal with them the way you're supposed to deal with them. What? When you, re- when you get reviled, revile not again. When you suffer, don't threaten. Look at what that last part of that verse says. But committed himself to him that judges righteously. Now that's a whole message within itself. So the last part of that verse says, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. What does that mean? He committed himself. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. What does that mean? We're going to look at a story in this in this in this, but committed himself that judges righteously. Basically, that means this, that when you have committed yourself to him that judges righteously, that's talking about God, you understand that even when you are mistreated, God is in control. And when he gets tired of people mistreating you, if, this is why it says that judges righteously. In other words, we're not Jesus Christ. We're not God in the flesh. So, we're only able to gauge the way people are treating us from our standpoint. From our standpoint, we might be completely wrong. We might think, oh, woe is me. Everybody's treating me wrong, and it's not everybody treating you wrong at all. It's you that's got this misconception. And so Jesus didn't have to do that because he knew who he was. He could have easily said, I'm righteousness. I am the righteousness of God. So everybody's wrong for mistreating me. Y'all wrong for crucifying me. But he didn't do that because, as what Peter is talking about, he is our example, and he set forth that example. So the example to us is this, that we are supposed to commit ourselves to to God who judges righteously. In other words, God ain't on our level. You know, as I've explained before, when when you have people around the same height and you got a bunch of people, like let's say, for instance, in the airport, and there's a bunch of people, you try to maneuver through those people because you're on the same level, and so you might bump into this, you might maneuver around this person, you might bump into this one. God don't is not on that level. He's up above, so he can see the path. He can see everybody in relation to how they are and what they are and what's on the inside of them. So he can tell more accurately. You're not being mistreated because you're so righteous. You're being mistreated because of how you are. It's something that you're bringing up on yourself. It's not that you're being mistreated. In other words, that's the way you're taking it because you walk around with offense or whatever the case is. Everybody understand? And so we have to, as children of God, commit ourselves to him that judges righteously. That's why, and when you do that, you're not worried about getting back at this person. I'm not going to get back at you because I might be wrong. And it takes humility to have that kind of stand. But oftentimes what happens is, when we feel like we've been mistreated, and when we feel like we've been wrong, what do we want to do? I'm going to get you back some kind of way. I'm going to get you back. I'm going to say something to you that's going to make you mad. I'm going to talk about you behind your back. I am going to get you back. And you know what happens when, when you do that? You're, even if you were being mistreated and even if you think you're justified, now you're just as wrong as the other person is. And instead of God exacting vengeance and rewarding you for suffering, you lose your reward. Because there is a reward that comes with suffering unwillingly uh, or, you know, unjustly, so to speak. And so when you exact your revenge, 
Now, God doesn't take it out. God doesn't avenge you. Actually, what happens now is he has to judge you for your part. That's what it means. When he was revived, he revived out again. He just let people talk about him. He let them try to kill him. He, he allowed things to take place. Not because he didn't have the power to, you know, come against people and to set them straight, but he just allowed it. For our example, that's what he meant when he prayed in the 17th chapter of John, that I have laid down my life for their sake. I have sanctified myself for their sake. And that's the way we have to look at it. We can't be going around getting back at people. That's, that's completely out of God's will. All right. Verse 24 says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. All right. Let's go to the fourth chapter of, of uh, actually the third chapter of First Peter now. Start reading at verse 13. And this is going to, well, let, actually, uh, we'll start reading at verse 8. It says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrariwise, blessing. That means when somebody's speaking evil to you or just spewing out whatever they're doing, don't return it. Contrariwise, speak blessing to them and be sincere. Not sarcastic because God knows the difference. Be sincere when you do those things. It says, knowing that ye are there unto call, just what he said in the second chapter. You're called to do that. Not only are you called to suffer, but you're called to bless those that curse you. That ye should do what? Inherit a blessing. That's how you inherit blessing. By blessing people that mistreat you. Jesus said in the fifth chapter of Matthew, what reward do you have if you're, if you're greeting those that greet you? If you're treating people right because they treat you right, the sinners do that. People, in, people that's going to hell do that. They even got enough sense to do that. So what reward do you have? What makes you different from sinners living out in the world that, that treat people right, that treat them right, that get along with people that get along with them, that do right unto them? You know, what, you know the Pharisees and the publicans, the tax collectors do that. So how are we different? This is what shows. This is the, 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 the line that's being drawn here. You see that? Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are there unto call, that you should inherit a blessing. For he that will live, that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. You see that? You want to live, you want to live long, number, and number two, see good days, because a lot of people live long, but they not, may not see good days. If you want to do those two things, live long and see good days, keep your tongue from speaking evil. Let him eschew evil. In other words, hate evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. That means that you try to live with peace, live in peace with all people. You, you seek peace. In other words, you're looking for peace. You're not just pushing people off that's trying to get close to you. You're looking for peace. Why? Because as long as you're not living in peace with people, you're going to constantly have something inside of you. All right. Why? Verse 12, it says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. You see that? The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, his ears are open unto their prayer. A lot of people, no matter how saved they are, their prayers aren't answered because they're not doing what this says do in the previous verses that we just read here. They're not hating evil. They're not doing good. They're not seeking peace to ensue it. They're not refraining their tongues. 
These are things that we have to constantly be watchful for as believers. All right, so the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Verse 13 says, And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? In other words, if, if you keep rendering evil for evil, all it's going to do is encourage the other person to continue doing what they're doing. But if you remain a sheep, if you remain the type of person that suffer, that's willing to suffer and suffer unjustly, unjustly, and allow people to what you think mistreat you or just rule over you or whatever, however you may think it may come, if you allow that, eventually, you know what's going to happen? They're going to stop. Why? Because of their conscience. The man, the centurion that was standing by the, by the cross that was crucifying Jesus Christ, when he saw how the Lord died, what did he say? Surely this man must have been the son of God. You think he'd have said that if the Lord would have been up there cussing everybody out and making faces? So <laughs> what does that tell us? If we want people to know that we are Christians, we have to act like sheep and not goats. We have to allow ourselves to be mistreated. We have to allow ourselves to go through things so that people can say, you know what? Because you know what I'm going to tell you? What I find when you allow people to mistreat you and other people are standing by is a witness to them mm. that there's something different about you. And you know what? God might move in some of those other people to take up your cause. I'm going to tell you, I have seen it flat out. I have seen it flat out. You don't have to say anything if you trust God. But a lot of times, people aren't willing to suffer. They try to avenge themselves. Why? Because they don't trust that God is going to do it. It's, one of them is pride because I shouldn't have to go through anything. And another thing is I don't trust that God is going to do it. He's not going to do it the way I want it done. And on top of that, I want to see. There was a young lady uh, several years ago that called me about her ex. And she just felt like he was just living it up. He had dogged her out, did her wrong, you know, slept with other women when they were together and just dogged her out. And she was into this thing of woe is me because I feel like I am got the short end of the stick. I was the one that was right. I was the one in church all the time. That knucklehead didn't go to church. He didn't do anything. And here it is. He's driving a Benz. He's living in a nice big old house with a swimming pool, an in-ground pool in the backyard, and I'm here struggling from paycheck to paycheck. When is God going to get him? Now, those are her exact words. When is God going to get him? Why does it look like he's living it up? This isn't fair. And what it did was it, it caused her to have a misconceived idea about God to where it affected her relationship with God because she felt like God rewarded evil And we know that was nothing but pride because pride was telling her that she deserved what he had. And he didn't deserve it based on how he treated her. Exactly. And so in her mind, I want to see God get him back. And I'm looking for the day that he falls. And I basically rebuked her. And I told her, you are wrong, sister. You are supposed to be praying for him. You are supposed to be praying for him, not looking for his downfall. I said, because the word of God is clear. We're supposed to pray for our enemies. Even when they have mistreated us, we pray for them. And when, when, and I told her, just the fact that you're thinking that way, it shows that your heart isn't right. You shouldn't be looking for somebody else's downfall. That's the devil. You shouldn't want anybody. I don't care. I hate to think that anybody is in hell. I, I, of course, I know it's true, but I, I wouldn't wish that upon the worst person that ever lived in this world. I wouldn't wish that upon anybody. That's the way we have to be. With our, with people that have done us wrong, we have to pray for them. We really have to, you know, because I'm going to tell you why. Truth be told, Everybody that's walking this earth have done something to somebody to hurt them. 
Everybody. Nobody walked through this world without hurting somebody. Everybody that's living have done something that somebody else can say, you've done this to me, and I don't feel like it was right. And so if we want to receive the mercy of God, we have to be willing to extend it. And part of that is, Lord, I'm willing to suffer, even when I don't think it's fair, I don't think it's right, I don't think, you know, that ain't nothing but flesh talking. Of course flesh don't want to suffer. But the fact of the matter is, if flesh were dead, it wouldn't even recognize the suffering that it's going through. It stings you. If somebody's dead, like say for instance, I, I, like I told my wife, this part of my leg right here is, is for the most part gone. The, the nerves are damaged to the point where you can stick a needle in there and I, I pretty much I feel the pressure, but I won't, it won't sting because the nerves are dead. Now, that is the way the Christian life is supposed to be. You might feel the pressure, but you shouldn't feel the sting if you're dead. When people are mistreating you, whatever, however they're acting towards you, you feel the pressure because you're, you know, you're not dead physically, but it shouldn't sting you because you have crucified your flesh already. Your flesh is supposed to be dead. So when people get offended, when they get upset about how they perceive they've been treating, being being treated, it's because flesh isn't dead yet. And so since flesh isn't dead, pride comes with it. I don't deserve this. I'm going to look out for myself because apparently I don't trust God enough. Now, that's really what we're saying. I don't trust God enough to look out for me, so I'm going to look out for me. God said, okay, you keep going. You keep on looking out for you. But you make sure that you answer your own prayers as well. Everybody understand? All right. All right, verse 14. But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. What does that mean? This is what we said earlier. That when people know that you're suffering unjustly and you aren't retaliating, you aren't trying to avenge yourself, they're going to ask, how in the world do you put up with that? How do you deal with that? And Paul, uh, Peter says right here, be ready to give an answer to every man that asks you of, of the reason of your hope. You see that? Why? Because I guarantee you, if you're suffering and there's an audience watching, and as long as you ain't cutting up and trying to revile back, they're going to look and they're going to wonder, and how are you dealing with that? How are you putting up with that? And that is an open door for you to testify. You know what? Years ago, I wasn't like that. I'd have punched him right in the throat. But today... I'm saved, and this is what I'm called to. The Lord has changed me. And you know what? They'll want that same peace that you have. All right. Verse 16, having a good conscience that, whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation, in other words, your good conduct or lifestyle in Christ. What does that mean? When the devil is saying bad things about you, you better make sure he's lying. Everybody understand? If the devil is saying, look, sister so-and-so is fornicating, she's lying, or she's doing this, or he's doing that, he's beating on his wife, he's doing this, you make sure he's lying. And, and in, other words, in other words, don't, don't let it be true. Ain't no use in crying out to the Lord, woe is me, if what people are saying is true about you. <laughs> Why? Verse 17 tells us, For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Why? Because you don't get a reward if you're suffering for evil-doing. If, you if you're suffering for something that you brought on yourself, that's you. Ain't no use in you crying out to the Lord about, woe is me, if, if you brought that on yourself. Mm 
And that's what people do. All right. Now let's go to, uh, well, we'll read verse 18 real quick. It says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And so that's why we're called to suffer. It is to show the world our hope, what we believe in, is an open door for us to witness to the world. Not necessarily with words, but with our lifestyle. Now, <clears throat> verse, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. The only way you're going to live perfect, the only way you're going to live holy before God is through suffering. Why? Because suffering brings about patience. Trials and tribulations, those things bring about patience. You can't gauge where you are in your spiritual walk with the Lord until you suffer. Because some kind of way, God has to show you what's on the inside of you. And so you can't gauge where you are in the Lord if you're not suffering. What? Not only that, what reward do you have if you're not suffering? The Bible says all they that live godly shall suffer persecution. If you're not suffering, that means you're not living godly. So if you're living godly and you're suffering persecution, why are you complaining if that comes with living godly? That's your crown. It's your suffering. That's what shows you that you're on the right path if you're suffering for, I mean, un unjustly. That's your crown. But no, we don't look at it like that. Now it's all about me. I rebuke the spirit of suffering. I ain't going to go through anything. God is going to have my back on everything. He's going to avenge my enemy, all this other junk. That's not the Lord speaking. We have to learn to suffer. The word of God says that because Jesus Christ suffered, now he reigns. When are you going to reign? How You're not reigning because you're not willing to suffer. How are you going to reign and be in high places, spiritually speaking, if you're not suffering? What have you gone through for the Lord? And when I say for the now, let me make this clear. When I say suffering, I'm talking about anything. It, ain't gotta, it doesn't have to be the idea of somebody nailing you to a tree somewhere because you believe in Jesus Christ. That's not, just, that's not what that's talking about, even though that could be part of it. That's not talking about suffering because you're calling on the name of Christ, necessarily. It's talking about anything, suffering unjustly. Why? Because the devil, the spirit of the devil, knows the spirit of God that's in you. And he might get somebody to pick on, on you at work, might not have anything to do with the Lord in your mind, but the whole time it's the spirit that's in that person that's coming against the spirit that's in you to prove that you aren't who you claim you are. Let me tell you something. The devil, you don't have to walk around saying you're a Christian for the devil to attack you. If you are a Christian, you can believe he's going to have somebody somewhere that's going to call you out on it. And it doesn't have to be a conversation of, I'm a Christian, oh, and I'm a devil worshiper, and I serve the devil, so I'm against you. It doesn't have to be that conversation. It can just be, you know what? I don't like your work, the work that you do. Nitpicking, all this stuff. You know, and that's just as much of a, of a spiritual attack as I don't like you because you're a Christian. The devil ain't going to cause that person to say that, even though deep down inside that might be what's going on. When we suffer unjustly, that's exactly what's going on. It's an attack of the enemy, and we have to allow ourselves to go through that and submit ourselves to him that judges righteously. Have anything you want to say? So, verse 1 again says, For as much then as Christ had suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. What does that mean? When you suffer and you allow yourself to go through it, 
pretty soon you develop this shell that allows you to take those hits, to take those blows. And when you when that shell is developed on you, now you're seizing from sin. Why? Because the suffering part removes your spirit man from your flesh. It removes your mind from your flesh. You learn, I have to deal with this. So if you, if you learn to suffer unjustly, you also learn to deny your flesh because really that's what you're doing. In reality, when you allow yourself to suffer, to be talked about, to be ridiculed, to be mistreated or whatever, in reality what you're doing is Denying your flesh. But see, when you retaliate, when you're going to exact revenge, you're not denying your flesh. So that what that does is, since you're not denying your flesh and, you know, from suffering, you're not going to deny your flesh from other things. Pornography, you're just going to just gonna heat it all up in your flesh. Why? Because you're serving your flesh now. All right. Let's keep reading here. For this, for the time past of our life, may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walk in lasciviousness, lust, access of wine, reveling, that's partying, banqueting, that's that's partying as well. Now, what is that talking about? When folks get together, carousing around, all that stuff, none of that is godly. Like parties. Reveling is more like clubbing, more like, uh, I guess, drunken parties. Uh, banqueting is basically people coming together, big crowds, I guess, but it's not necessarily a party, but the atmosphere is there for that. Like at a park, people get all, all kind of people gathering at the park. You know, it's not family event. It's people just getting together. Might be they might be drinking or something like that. All of that is you know banqueting. You have you ever been in a crowd of people? You might have been invited somewhere, been in a crowd of people, and you're uneasy because you could tell that something is not just something is not right. That's what that is. And it, and I've been in, in, in places where I could tell something was going to happen because it was just something that wasn't right. But see, that's what happens is the devil gets all of these spirits in one place and they get to fighting one another. And it, and it goes into the natural realm. All right. Abominable idolatry. Now, if you remember, uh, and I, I, I can't remember if it was in Numbers, where the, the 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 people, the children of Israel yielded themselves to idolatry. They ate. The Bible says they ate, and they, then they rose up to play, and God struck them. But why? Because they weren't reverencing Him. It was all about partying. It was all about. You ever known somebody that they live for that? They just got to be out in the crowd somewhere. They're not happy unless they're around a bunch of people all the time. They just they just got it in them. I just got to be somewhere. Got a house, but they hardly ever there. That's a spirit that causes people to be that way. There, are, I've heard people tell me that just every time the club opened, they had to be there. That is a spirit, and the Lord told me that that there is a partying spirit. It don't have to. You don't have to be in a club. All you have to do is just want to be around a bunch of people all the time. Just want to be around a crowd all the time. That's banqueting. and that's a partying spirit. You ain't you ain't preaching to them. Nobody there preaching. They're talking about all kind of ungodliness. All right, verse five says, "Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit." And that's how. That's what we're called to do. We're judged by men in the flesh. In other words, we suffer. 
but we live according to we live according to God and the Spirit, and that's what helps us to live according to God and the Spirit. All right, let's go to the book of Second Samuel, real quick. We're gonna read a, a story real quick, just very brief story. Second Samuel, the 16th chapter. And here, uh, let me get you up to speed. Of course, by this time, David has slept with Bathsheba, has gotten her pregnant, has had her husband killed. Nathan has been sent to David to tell him that you're going to pay for this. God has forgiven you, but the sword will never leave your house. Your, your, your children are going to sleep. Your son is going to sleep with your concubines on the rooftop in front of all of Israel. The kingdom is going to be taken from you for a while. Your son is going to take, try to take the kingdom from you. And so he accepts that. So here is David, his son. One of his sons has slept with one of his daughters. And then the, the, the brother of the girl killed that son. Then you got another brother that's taking over one of David's sons, taking over the kingdom, and basically have run David out of the kingdom. Is it? Now, let's think about this. David was a mighty warrior. His sons weren't warriors. They weren't battle men like he was. You think about it. David, as a child, killed a bear and a lion. Killed Goliath. You think he wasn't able to, to handle up on his sons and choke them? But he accepts that. Everybody understand? This same David was anointed king at a very young age, probably about 13 or 14 years old. It was some 14, 15 years later that he actually took the kingship, that the kingship, listen, was given to him. He didn't say, he didn't go to, uh, to Saul and say, look, Saul, God, have I been anointed king? You just need to step down. He waited. And even when Saul was trying to kill him, he didn't try to kill Saul back. He didn't try to get back at Saul. And when he found out that Saul had been killed, he avenged that death. And he caused all of Israel to weep and mourn for Saul. A man that had hunted him down for 14 years to try to kill him. So now when judgment is pronounced on David and he's suffering, he don't tell God, look, I'm your great servant and I don't deserve this. Let's go ahead and read chapter uh, 16 of 2 Samuel. He's on his way. He's left Israel already, and he's, and he's walking to just go somewhere, you know, to some other camp because he's been thrown out of the kingdom. Verse 5 says, And when King David came to Baharim, behold, thence came out of a man, came out a man of the house of the house, out of the, of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, thy son. And behold, thou art taken in, in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. You know, he's calling call him a killer. Now, David didn't have anything to do with Saul being killed. Then said Abishai, the son of Zerah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my Lord, the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And the king said, What have I to do with thee, ye sons of Zerah? So let him curse, because the Lord has said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? He's saying, This is happening because God allowed it. God told him to do that. Mm -hmm. So who are you? And so when we are going through our little turmoil, maybe we should look at it at, from that instant. Maybe God has allowed it. What? Why? To teach me to, how to suffer. 
Verse 11, and David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. In other words, what David said, I got a whole lot of other stuff going on besides this, this guy here cursing me. My son and kicked me out of the kingdom and he's trying to kill me. Hmm. Let him alone. Let him curse me. The Lord is bidding that. Now, again, I'm going to say this, and I can't stress this enough. Whenever we're suffering unjustly, if God allow it, that means you ought to allow it. God knows how to take up for you. But a lot of times, God allows those things to teach us patience, to teach us to cease from sin. Why? Because the word, what we just read, those that suffer in the flesh, they cease from sin. Verse 12, it may be, now look at what David's saying here. It may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction and that the Lord will requite me good for his curse in this day. Now, didn't we just read that in the book of, of uh, 1 Peter, that we receive blessings when we're cursed? And when we bless those that are cursing us, when we're not returning evil for evil and railing for railing, that we receive blessings when we, when we don't do that, when we do what the word says do, and pray for them and bless them instead of cursing them? Verse 13, and as David and his men went by the way, Shimon went along on the side, on the hill side over against them. And, and he cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. And the king and all the people that were with him came weary and refreshed themselves there. Now, the whole time, so this is the picture. David and his servants are walking by this man's yard. The man come out of the, the, out of the house. And the whole time, David... And his servants, and these are mighty men. Now, let's think about it. These are mighty men. These aren't little peons. The whole time that they're walking by this man's yard, the man is throwing dirt at him, he's throwing rocks at him, and he's cursing him. And they're dealing with it. That, now, here's another thing. David and his men, they don't try to move away from it. They don't go to the other side of the street. David stays there, and he allows it to happen because it was meant to teach him to cease from sin. Why? What got him in this mess in the first place? His sin. And it was designed to teach him to cease from sin. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this word that we've heard tonight, Lord, and we ask that you will help us to abide in what you've taught us. Thank you, Lord, for the suffering that we go through. Help us to have a right attitude when it comes to suffering. God, we pray that you will give us the faith to continue on, to move forward, even when we suffer unjustly, Lord. And God, we also pray for those that may bring about our suffering, that you will be merciful to them, Lord, that you will help us to see them as you see them, Lord, as people that you have died for. Help us to bless those that are cursing us, Lord, to pray for those that spitefully use us. We'll give you the honor and the praise. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.